Hello out there, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of H1Z1 Dead Feature Ran. Today we've got some awesome folks. Uh, we always have awesome folks. I don't know why I say that. Uh, up top, we have returning guest Skylatron. She's been uh, on Dead Feature Ant. She's been on Live Feature Ant. Weren't you also on uh, 3 Forge at some point? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah I was. <laughs> so you, you've basically been on just about every uh, talk show that comes on here. Yeah. <laughs> totally awesome. Very cool. Totally appreciate it. And um, File Fan, first time on the show here. It is awesome having hey. you on. Um, Thank you very much. That uh, that H one Z one beanie is um, no uh, no no trick of magic. He actually has that. Got it at uh, SOE Live twenty fourteen, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Yep. Yes. Jeez. Fantastic few days. Yeah. We partied it up. You missed out, Krem. <laughs> <laughs> we partied so hard on Sunday night. It was ridiculous. I was still there. I just wasn't invited. I, well, jerks. there was no yeah, there was jerks. an open invitation. There was no, the invite. It, it was, was just it was like, well, I just yeah. didn't know about it. It was just like, oh yeah, go to Zube <laughs> and Reynezra's wedding, and then after that, you know, party for like approximately <laughs> till three a.m. Nice. <laughs> and then Skyla just kept on party, and then just packed her bags and left for an early flight. So, ah, <laughs> 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 uh, fun stuff, fun stuff. So. H one Z one. Sony Shock is now playing H one Z one. Yeah, I just saw that too. <laughs> Jerk. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Jimmy was actually it's playing for us. Ah, oh, I'm hoping that he can. I'm hoping that he can get some for us. But no, it's probably going to be on uh, on the fifteenth when we all get a chance to play it for twenty bucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. It's all good though. I'm I'm excited. I'm willing to pay it. I spent a hundred dollars oh, on yeah. a Trailblazer for Landmark. I don't regret that. No, so, episode thirty-five here. Prepare to survive. It's kind of like a play on words because it's also it. It's not just like you know, prepare for the act of surviving, but also like you know, the idea of someone packing their bags and getting all stuff ready because they're gonna have to survive for a while. So, a eh, little bit of both. Two days, everybody. Two days, and it's here. And counting. And counting. Can't Get move. hyped, everybody. Get real I hyped. I need to delay it. <laughs> that would be so awesome. <laughs> what are the words you said? What were the words I said? I think they should delay it. Oh. Oh, yeah. It would be, no, if they say to that they're going to delay it a certain amount, but then release it before that, just to give the, kind of the switcheroo to people. <laughs> that would be better than actually delaying it. Ban Skylatron. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So we actually have a lot of stuff to talk about. We're not just going to blab on about uh, this and that. We could do that whenever. We're probably going to do that after the show for a bit too. But for the actual mm -hmm. content, we're going to be looking first at the dev blog from uh, Dave Abram. That's, uh, let me get you folks the link for it in chat so you can kind of look on and we're not really going to go through all of the detail of it um why did i just hear a wilhelm that shouldn't be happening <laughs> oh well um so here you go folks and he he's basically kind of showing off some of what he's working on which is the physics of vehicles and falling and going off of cliffs and stuff which you know, it not only sounds like a lot of fun to work on, but it's a really important detail. You don't want to, you know, drive something off a cliff and then just have it go end over end all of a sudden because some weird thing with the physics or likewise drive <laughs> off a cliff and it doesn't angle itself any way at all. And it just kind of goes in a straight line until it hits the ground. That wouldn't be good either. So um, this is what he's been working on here. He's um had some of the same sorts of stuff going on. He's worked on Planet Side 2 before it, so it's not like he just started working on this. He's probably the best guy to be working on this stuff with his uh, past experience on it. And it's um, it's kind of an interesting read. Uh, was there anything in particular that any of you folks uh, saw in it and wanted to uh, comment on? or No? Nope. Nope. <laughs> 
<laughs> Nothing specific. Read, read the dev blog, watched the video. Yeah, it's like, oh, okay, cool. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, pretty much. It's, I guess if you're more into the technical side of things, if you're into, like, um, you know, physics programming and stuff, it would be um, a little bit more relevant. But it's... Um, it's pretty cool. I like it. I, I like getting. I always like getting to see the in-engine tools and kind of works in progress and stuff. But that's that's kind of the the dev in me being like, oh, I want to see how other people do it. <laughs> <coughs> hmm. So, enough about that subject. Once again, everybody, there it is. You can uh, check it out and uh, read it up on your own time. Jumping change. What is what is this from Scribe here? It's pretty cool. They worked on the jumping animation. Oh, thank you very much for the link. Let's see it. Ah, it looks a lot more like a jump. Maybe. I don't I know. I think so. The Maybe, back is know. the back is a little weird. Yeah. But the legs are better, I guess. Yeah, it's still a little straight. Like stiff. It still feels like it's being oriented based on like the hips and the inverse kinematic like foot point or whatever not so much um not so much taking the full body into consideration quite yet but in due time i mean it's a lot of it's a lot of work to make all of those things um you know fully functional and really polished and you know they have plenty of time it's just going it's just going to be starting early access it isn't like it's been in early access for like 6 months or whatever We're like oh can we please get a new jump which is kind of one of the good reasons why they delayed it like they did. You know, getting us yeah. a more polished product <laughs> earlier on. For sure. So here's a, a couple little tidbits. Um, there's going to be PVE servers on day one. In fact, here's the uh, the tweet Smedley made about it. And it got some good reaction, some bad reaction. Eventually, a uh, friend of the show, Poro Sorceress, kind of put him in his place. It's like, hey. Don't be a jerk. My friends will take our money elsewhere. He's like, uh, sorry. Or actually, no, he said, oh, it was just in good fun. Well, you can read it all. It's all there. But the main point to discuss, though, is that PVE servers will be in on day one. So, That's good. yeah, absolutely. For anybody who wants to play PVE, for anybody who wants to try to learn the game in a bit of a safer environment where, you know, they'll be getting ganked by animals and zombies but not other players um that's that's definitely a good sort of thing to have available i will probably end up checking them out just to see kind of what they're like and you know how they grow and develop differently i would imagine there's gonna be a lot more player structures in the world in a pve server than a pvp <coughs> server is uh so i guess around the table what are what's everybody's plans on PvP, PvE, don't know until you try it? I'll probably try both, but um, I'm leaning more towards the PvP myself, so... But, I mean, I'll, I'll certainly try out PvE so just so I can see what it's like. Yeah, for sure. How about you, Skyla? Um, I am definitely prefer the PvP servers, um, so I'll be using that mainly, but I can see PvE, I mean being really useful for uh, the other portion of my job, which is writing guides. Um, if I'm actually able to craft in a PvE environment without getting ganked a bunch, then I'll be able to uh, to write guides easier. <laughs> that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, taking that into account, I would imagine um, if somebody is trying to focus more on bug testing, it'll probably be a lot easier, unless you're specifically looking at PvP stuff, it's probably a lot easier to do on a PvE server just because that's one less type of threat and you might actually you know convince a crew of people to help protect you or help try to execute that bug and you know be able to report on it so i mean there's yeah. uh there's there's a lot to it the the phrase care bear uh i th is was that a wow term or was that a pre-wow term for people that i just know it from from uh i know pre-wow i know pre-wow okay yeah it's it's a pretty old term yeah, basically it's for people that want to play in an environment where they aren't uh, forced or prompted or otherwise to fight and kill other players. And I know it's definitely a um, kind of meant as a diminutive term to, uh, you know, 
it, it it's it's instead of just saying you know PVP versus PV, it's oh yeah you're a Care Bear, I play a hardcore PVP sir, yeah. Yeah, it's it's really almost feels like it's just like an EP and sort of thing. So it is, yeah, for sure. It's it's supposed to be a joke. I mean, nobody that says you're a Care Bear like really is coming at you hard. But I don't They're know. Just messing like, with you. What's the inverse of a Care Bear? Skeletor. Like, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> oh, you're just a Skeletor. <laughs> uh, we either called them blue servers or. Or uh, Care Bear when it was uh, back in EverQuest. Mm. So. Well, it was blue because they labeled them differently on the server select. I think so. I think so. That would make sense. Okay, so that's 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 a long and thorough answer to your question there, Stone Glade. <laughs> now, uh, one other thing to keep in mind is it's not going to be eating into the under fifty servers that Smedley initially said because he recently oh, also good. said we're going to be seeing. 150 to 200 servers on day one. <coughs> now that makes oh. a lot more sense with the numbers. Yeah, yeah for that's sure. That's really good to know. We uh, we talked about it a no little congestion. bit. Sorry, what was that? I just said no congestion. Yeah, for sure. Well, hopefully. Um, well, fingers crossed. Yeah. Well, there's also <laughs> going to be a lot of fine tuning of like the players versus zombie count, and that's one way that they could actually fluctuate the population on servers. Is I believe they said uh, ten zombie AIs relative to one player AI in terms of server impact. So if they just thin the herd a little bit to make more room for players, what that kind of balances is that you have less threats from from the world and more threats from actual players in the world which can potentially be a lot more intelligent and dangerous than 10 zombies or 10 wolves. Maybe not 10 bears. I think 10 bears is still more dangerous. Um, than anything ever. Yeah, bear stampede is pretty much going to wreck faces. So get away from that <laughs> if you see it. Good Lord. Yeah. Uh, you better have a, a bazooka. Yeah, you better have something. <laughs> you better have a lot of something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So yeah, 150 to 200. Now we were kind of uh, theory crafting on this a little bit with the A1P1 crew uh, last week, both on their show and on this show, about the what the numbers would actually kind of look like. And I've kind of tried to ex extrapolate down to maybe approximately, I said initially uh, mathematically 181, so closer maybe like 200 players per server is what I would expect initially. And if that's the case, you know... Um, 40,000 players, that's that's a pretty good amount to be able to kind of hedge for at one time. Yeah, for sure. How did you come up with your your number there? Basically taking um, 2,000 per, um, per continent from Planet Side 2 and then yep. kind of extrapolating if uh, one player versus, you know, ten, 10 zombies per player or whatever is the ratio they're looking to have or whatever. Um, I'll have to I'll have to look back at my math again. It was it was basically something that um, to have an appropriate amount of zombies per player or whatever, you'd have to reduce the amount of actual players in the world. Um, but it could be a lot more. It could be completely off with that. I think I might have also done the math at like two or three a.m. after a few drinks. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> everything's a little suspect. Though I can speak on it with confidence, even though, <laughs> yeah. You know what you said. Talk a big game. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's um, that's going to be pretty cool. That's that's a lot of servers to hold a lot of people. And the fact that there's going to be a lot of room for things to kind of fluctuate, um, it'll be really nice. Hopefully there shouldn't be any congestion on day one. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this is also going to be uh, across all of the regions that they, they support for English-supported games. So... I believe this means there's going to be servers in Australia, New Zealand area. There's going to be servers in North America. There's going to be servers in Europe. So nobody's going to have port ping to deal with. And that's a big deal because if people have to deal with port ping, it definitely cuts their um, their ability to be effective at testing the game and giving good feedback. And speak of the devil, A1P1 podcast, how's it going? <laughs> Speak of the devil and he shall appear. <laughs> oh, man. So, surviving in H1Z1. 
there's a lot to the subject. There's, you know, there's so many considerations, not just, you know, the idea of PVP server versus PVE server, whether you're going to be out in the wilderness versus trying to approach more urban areas, uh, if you're going to be solo, small group, large group, lone wolf that'll sometimes join up with the group and then run off with their stuff in the middle of the night, you know, what, whatever it's <laughs> going to be. Like, there's, there's so many ways to play the game. Just try to be a mountain man who lives off the land far away from any industry and... Uh, you know, just try to be a hunter trapper, and whenever bears come through, go far, far away and hide behind a bush or something. So, what are your, um, I guess, main thoughts on uh, what what considerations? Well, actually, I should I'll, I'll take that back. File fan, since you were um, you you were really interested in talking about survival, what were some of the yes. main subjects that you would wanted to kind of talk about or get feedback? Um, on? One of the things that I'm interested in, it's not just the survival from the zombies itself, which is obviously a pivotal part of the game, but how different groups of um, players cooperate or not cooperate, as the case may be, with each other, um, either within the group or opposing factions, etc. Um, as the game gets more set up, like they're going to be like raiding one another. and like, For example, in the Walking Dead TV series, you see that one of the main threats isn't so much from the zombies as it is from you know, the other survivors. Seriously. Um, so survival for so survival for me was you know it's, it would be really interesting to see how it's going to evolve, not just with the zombies but with the other players. Yeah, for sure, um, for sure. I mean that's a, a large chunk of what I'm looking forward to seeing unfold and explore. So it's um, it's more of the the macro scale, like once people are established, how they're going to kind of keep their dominance in the area and continue to progress. Yeah, that, yeah, that type of thing. Um, what, what what is it going to take to once you've set up your dominance in the area? What what is it going to take to remain dominant in the area? Um, again, I don't know how far the game is going to go in that respect. But again, to use the Walking Dead as an example, some of the things they've had to do to remain, you know, dominant. You start you start seeing like things like you're trying to protect your humanity and your way of life. But can you do that without, you know, a sort of end of the world style scenario? Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm putting that across properly. <laughs> no, no, I know what you mean. Now, there's there's a lot of also uh, big considerations to think about with um, Walking Dead because there's not only taking over and establishing uh, you know a city and basically making it their own, but then there's also the constant like moving from location to location. Um, I, I unfortunately haven't followed the series entirely as uh, closely as I've needed to, but I know there's a, uh, there was, there was a prison they were using at some point. I think there's a, a city they've got somewhere. And then the last one that I was watching, there was a church that they had set up, but then uh, the, the, the preacher guy or whatever got them screwed, and they basically had to leave that location. Um, I'm, I'm not as far ahead as, as, as I... I know it's in season five in the US for you guys. I'm only halfway through season four. But yeah, there was a prison, the main character set up in a prison in the previous season and there was a town across the way that the sort of the governor as it was is was in charge of and they effectively went to war with one another and and that sort of still followed from that sort of place still playing out in season four. Um but that is a great example of, you know, they're trying to you know, groups trying to set up their own remnants of humanity again and another group coming along and Sort of clashing with it. Yeah. And what what that actually brings up is a really interesting point in H1Z1 is that there's actually kind of two ways to set up shop in an area. There's actually constructing your own base from scratch and doing whatever you can to, you know, maintain containment around that area and, you know, potentially advance further or create supply lines from, uh, you know, safe areas that are easy to raid and loot. The other is taking over existing infrastructure of different levels and then trying to work from there to kind of keep control of the surrounding area. A small team could take over one house in a city and then kind of live off the uh, the loot of that city for a little while or potentially, um, you know, taking over uh, an outpost like just a, a random church out in the wild or whatever out, you know, off of some, you know, dirt road that 
a lot of people pass by that area and a lot of people look there for supplies. So they set up there specifically to extort people that come through and looking for stuff. People setting up and taking over entire apartment complexes and having like five, uh, you know, five, and this would be very rare, but having five hunting rifles actually in that building kind of point, pointing out of the windows at all times, that is going to be just really, really difficult. Just having that access to those kind of weapons. So, um, I guess that we, we haven't heard from Skyla and Krem. I see you've been uh, chatting up in the uh, chat there a little <laughs> bit. So kind of, what are your, what are your thoughts on this? The idea of, you know, different ways to set up and the, uh, the kind of rivalries that are going to grow from people setting up shop in an area through, you know, taking stuff over or building their own stuff or just moving in on someone else's territory. Well, for me, I'm just going to have my people blind, blindly follow me and take over stuff and then I'll ruthlessly murder them all and then rinse and repeat. So we know who not to follow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, people still will. Avoid, uh, avoid you like the plague on the server is what you're saying. <laughs> so I'm, I'm interested in the value of actually setting up in a specific spot. Um, since item spawns take into account the number of people in an area, what sort of value does it offer to take over a town and just stay there since you won't be getting item spawns really anymore? Uh, sort of wondering if people are going to do that or if they're going to take more of a migratory path, come through, clear out everything, and then, you know, just go from base to base. Well, there's a few advantages I could see from taking over a town. For one, if you can get full containment over the area, no zombies will then spawn in that area. So you'll actually have a large area where people will then be able to kind of move in. Whether or not you're going to have a housing committee and, you know, invite people or like, you know, at gunpoint be like, all right, this is where you live. Now, you know, if you're not back at, you know, this time tomorrow, we shoot you and take your stuff or you know, whatever it's going to be. I'm sure ridiculous stuff will come of it. Um, hmm. I guess throwing it back to you, file fan. I guess uh, full circle. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I it, it's um, on on the subject of being able to actually take places over. Like, what what do you think about the the idea of items spawning when you've taken an area over versus having to? kind of keep moving around because that is a big consideration if you take over an area and nothing's going to spawn there unless you have manufacturing tools and production systems that make the area worthwhile you're basically kind of pigeonholing yourself in a uh, kind of a low loot area uh i personally uh, like the idea of it um if you were to take over like a building for example once you've looted it i personally like the idea of it nothing there spawning again um for example, if it was a farm, you you know you have the ability to grow food and crops, um, but I don't think the cupboard should just keep spawning every like five hours with more food there. Or uh, that's just my personal opinion, but I think it adds to the the realism and the again the feel that you've got to really survive. Well, maybe not necessarily that building, but you take over one apartment and like two apartments over doesn't get item respawns because of it. So you've looted out like everything in a, a two building radius and then there's nothing more because people are active in the area would that do you think that would be a problem um i, I don't personally have a problem i uh, think there's an issue with like if you've got if, you, if you've taken over say out of the floor of an apartment um at the floor above and below i i don't see if they're if they're not being they may be being looted but they've not been actually taken over then i i don't see a problem with respawns there because they don't actually belong to anybody as such um like again that's just me that, that that i suppose i would again that would take away from the realism i suppose it's i i wouldn't see a problem with that it's ironically it's one of those things that they've talked about a lot is trying to balance fun and realism because it, yeah you can't have both there's going to be things where you get it too realistic and it's not fun anymore Real exactly, life sucks. Yeah, it's... <laughs> I need to make a difference in real life. <laughs> I, I would say that an area that a little bit has been looted but hasn't been like occupied as such should be allowed to respawn, in my opinion. Again, I don't know what you guys think on that. It's 
I'm fine with an area that you actually kind of own and take over and have containment in not having things respawn anymore. But if it's somewhere that a zombie could potentially spawn in, then it's somewhere that an item should potentially be able to spawn in. I just don't know what yes. the what the proximity is going to be for that sort of thing. And if there is going to be a larger sense of containment that if we get, you know, it's like a, a four by four block and we take all the perimeter buildings, will stuff stop spawning in the inter interior four buildings or um, are we still going to be able to kind of utilize those as areas to loot every now and then? So it, it, it creates an interesting situation. And I wonder, I really wonder how it's going to be resolved. We're, you know, it's something that's probably going to be in flux throughout all of early access because I'm sure it's going oh, to definitely. be something where, yeah, it's, uh, sometimes there'll be too many items, so they pull back on it a bit and fine tune it. Sometimes there's going to be not enough items to even survive and eat. So they'll have to add a little bit more in. And there's, you know, different considerations for different levels of urban density. Full on apartments and warehouses, that's zombie city, but that's also where there's going to be mad loot versus you know a few rural homes on a, a dirt road you know no power lines nearby that's probably going to have more opportunities to loot it if you just come by it you know randomly but ultimately it's going to have way less loot and you know going to be less overall opportunities there and they haven't had this many people on the servers yet so yeah i think everything that we do is going to be uh, going to be in flux the entire time during early access, and I think that's fine. I think it's going to make for some really interesting uh, control points, <laughs> how we actually go about doing that. Yeah. What it also does is that it encourages if you take over an area and you're not going to be finding loot because the, uh, the spawning's cut, that you then find areas nearby that maybe, you know, 10, 15 minutes travel or less on foot. And just use those as the areas that you raid and loot constantly. It's like, okay, you know, Monday we go north to whatever town. We loot that. Tuesday we, you know, hunt in the wilderness. Wednesdays we go west and, uh, you know, raid whatever player encampment set up there. And if we don't find any, then just, you know, chop down some trees and kill some stuff in the wild. Uh, you know, something like that where people, they set up when they go where to make sure that there's, um, you know, a chance for everything to respawn and to kind of maximize their efforts to make sure they all go to the right place, even if everybody doesn't log on at the same time and depart at the same time. So, you know, that sort of stuff, I could see a lot of that planning going into it. And then as people get vehicles, um, if it's an area you know pretty well, it's probably going to be a lot safer driving back and forth between a common spawn or a common uh, uh, loot point, rather than if it's new territory and you're just kind of driving around trying to find a place. I could see people really being able to set up full-on supply lines, even if it's just like, you know, bicycling back and forth, and you just, you know, take rotations or whatever because of stamina considerations. And then there will always be that unknown of the of the person who decides to come in and just disrupt your supply line by setting up really close to your, uh, to wherever it is that you're trying to loot stuff from. Yeah. Just to mess with you. Yeah, well, that's what guns are for. If you're actually established that well in an area, hopefully you've actually found a couple firearms and some ammo to use with it. Maybe a little bit of armor to make you intimidating so you might not actually have to fire the guns, too. Not be able to change your keybinds in early access. Um... That sounds weird. They've got keybinds already set up in Landmark and Planetside 2. If it isn't in, it might just be because they haven't set up the UI for it, which is a quick fix, and I'm sure they'll get that set up pretty quickly. Did Landmark not have keybinds or something at the beginning? Initially, it didn't, but it was also because yeah, it was a completely uh, different control scheme. Um, yeah. And also, they didn't have the link-ups and everything in the UI for it. So That was for months, wasn't it? Yeah, well, it was a low priority. Yeah, it was a while. Yeah. <laughs> High for some, low for others. I, that's the sort of thing I usually try to get after first, but, you know. It I, was crazy for me, because I usually have my, like, third mouse button on auto run, and that was that drove me crazy. You can finally do it, though. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, more on the subject of survival. Now, 
Uh, heat is another major consideration. Now we're talking about like the idea of taking a place over and using it as a base of operations. Well, for a small group of three or four people, I can see that being more possible. If you've got a group of like, you know, 40 to 50 rowdy people, that's, it's not going to work the same. You take over, you know, uh, an apartment building or whatever. Great. You've just made a heat magnet and all the zombies in the area are coming your way and all the predatory animals are coming your way. And likewise, all of the, uh, prey animals and, and scaredy cats are going the opposite direction. So it kind of creates a situation where you have to be tactful about where you actually do set up shop. Otherwise you're going to basically make things worse for yourself and kind of also at the same time, almost make things easier for people around you. Which, I mean, I guess if you're going to be a nice guy, that's great, but not everyone wants to play the Pied Piper of zombies. That's, you know, <laughs> it's, I think that's more like you've got more than five zombies chasing you on foot. That's kind of bad. You've got 20 zombies chasing you, even on a bicycle. That's oh shit mode. They're going to catch up yep. to you. They're going to path different ways. And you're creating. Maybe need to find a settlement and just take them there. Train. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> this is very, very true. So I guess um, heat. So what? What? What are the major worries that you would have with um, you know heat in large groups versus small groups and. Um, how that would affect the ability to actually set up shop in an area and defend it. Cause I remember there's like the, when I would see the prison, um, in, uh, walking dead, there's just always constantly a bunch of zombies, their face mashed against the, uh, the chain link fence. Live fence. Yeah. Yep. One of the scenes in fact had, um, in a recent episode I saw just, there was, I can't remember why they were attracted to the, the, the prison, but they were get they were attracted on my en masse and they're like, all ran effectively. They brought the fence down uh, in a section and like stormed the the prison. Obviously, the survivors had to sort of scramble together to take them out. I can't remember what it was that attracted them. Yeah, well, um, I mean, just being there and making sound and having a presence over a period of time, I would imagine right. would attract them. That's that scene actually, or the first time I saw it, is basically what I thought of when I first kind of heard about the heat system. Is the idea that yeah. Eventually, there's just going to be a mass of things banging on the gates. And there's, presumably, there'll be a way to, like, you know, to thin them out. It's maybe one of these things that you'll have to keep doing in your group if you've got a base. Is send a detachment of people out to thin out the zombies, if you like, or mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah, that's what. You, yeah, that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have a zombie party at all times. Yeah. yeah that's. Yeah. I would imagine. I mean, if if it's come coming down to how many zombies you can handle as a group, not necessarily just like how many are going to break through your walls. It really won't matter how many people you have, because if four people attract twenty zombies, then you know twenty people are going to attract a hundred zombies or whatever the math is. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. exactly right. But you have the people to kill those that amount of zombies. So, hopefully. Now, hopefully you've got the tools and the equipment to do it and, you know, not have it all run out of ammo and durability by the end. Because <laughs> that's going to be true. another consideration. Though, for how easy it is to make spears, I don't know how hard it's really going to be to to arm up an area. And after seeing them being used yesterday on uh, uh, Jimmy's, or I guess it was last night, kind of this morning, on Jimmy's um, little impromptu stream from the office, spears are amazing. They're great. You can knock things down. You kind of charge up and stick them. Um, I don't know if it has a combo consideration. I hope it does. Uh, but then the other thing, you right click, you kind of bring it up, and then when you kind of line up your shot, you're a little above, but you know, up and down aligned. You let go, and they chuck that spear. It's got maybe about maybe an effective range of max of 20, uh, 30 meters actually, and yeah, you'll stick things. And the spear sticks mm -hmm. out of them. If you stick a player with it, I'm pretty sure they're dead. Uh, or at least horribly wounded. Eventually. Um, yeah, and you can just kind of make them, it seems like, from... There's actually a very thin tree you can find out in the wild now. 
instead of needing an axe or anything, you just kind of walk up to it and kind of push it over and you get a, a, a stick out of it. So there are ways that you can actually kind of arm yourself. Now that there aren't axes that you start with, they, they did away with that a while ago. Uh, you can still arm yourself really quickly with what's available out in the wild. So that's really, really cool. Though I wonder if there's um, just a straight up club, like you've got a stick, you need to hit something. Can I equip the stick as a weapon? I don't know if they have got that yet, but now that I think about it, <laughs> a stick. It kind of makes sense to be able to fight black, like a caveman. Black. Yeah. Well, no, not not like a little stick, but like you know, a walking stick or something. <laughs> a log. Well, nah, not Still quite a, a log. Stick isn't going to do much. It's going to give I mean, you a little bit of range and get you a little bit a more little momentum. Bit. <laughs> I mean, the screamadors are only using an eighteen-inch stick, and they can fuck shit up with that. <laughs> It's just hardened rattan, just fire hardened rattan. Yes, morning wood, but that's going to require some nails to make. You can't just make morning wood with a stick. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. if, if anybody's wondering, by the way, morning wood is the special skin for the nail bat that was available for uh, SOE Live. It was either the $20 subscription to SOE Live on Twitch that you could get, or it was the loot card. It was definitely one of the two. And the result is you'll get access to the Morning Wood skin. So, yeah. A battle staff would be fun. You're right, Wolfen 2K7. Later down the road, let's give them some time. I think it's better for them to work out the more conventional attacks and animations right now before, you know, going out there with the bow staff like uh, Friar Tuck or, um, or getting out with some, uh, what is it, Aikido that uses a staff? think so uh the farmer with the quarter staff <laughs> nice one falcon gray Could i be. like the bad fx7 says nobody gave skyla a hat <laughs> i have a hat but they were giving me a hard time about not wearing my hat so i just continued not wearing my hat i wasn't giving you a <laughs> hard time <laughs> they equals me right yeah <laughs> Thanks, Krim. <laughs> <laughs> At first, it was just a, a recommendation. And then when she started giving me a hard time about it, that's when it became an order. And that's when it became a no. Then we were giving each other hard things, and then it just went downhill. And, then, and that's where the morning wood comes from. So, the... Um, the game's going to be coming out here in two days, obviously, and you know everybody here is going to be playing it because you know that's what we're going to be doing. Kremchek's going to be playing it for ninety-six hours, rotating with his wife and his cousin. Um, yep. Skylatron, it sounds like you're going to be writing up guides like mad, so that's totally awesome. Yep, going to be streaming uh, on my personal channel on the Ten Ten Hammer channel and writing guides. Nice, very cool. And definitely be tuning in to vote. What's so funny? <laughs> Are you still laughing? H1Z1 Jane. No, yeah, H1Z1 Jane. Yeah, he said, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 That definitely happened. <laughs> <laughs> it was a drawing, everybody. We're talking about a drawing. <laughs> right. That's what we're talking about. Right. Oh, the drawing. Yeah. Yes. That. <laughs> So I guess initial plans, if you have any initial plans, what what are you going to be doing on day one? What's, what's like, not necessarily the first hour, because I think a lot of what everybody's going to be doing at the very beginning is just based on your surroundings and where you start. But like, what are some of yeah. your initial goals and some of the things you want to try out in the, the very beginning of things? I just want to get, uh, like you say, initially get your feel for it. Um... I say I want to see, but I, I want to see the PVE, but I'm much more interested in a PV, the PVP servers. Um, like I say, I want I want to you know hopefully form a, a group, guild, clan, whatever they're going to be. I know that's I read in that list they're not on day one, are they? The guild uh, clans. I no, no, I think they're in, not in day one. Yeah, they're I think, not day one. That, yeah, that's what I thought. They're yeah, they, they've but even then you it. can. Sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, even then, you know, if, if you're meeting up with your friends online and that, you can sort of unofficially make 
you know, your own unofficial group, as it were. I mean, that's what people were doing in Landmark before the the official guild yeah. thing came along. Well, that was just chat channels. It's it's a lot easier to have global chat channels in a sandbox uh, creative MMO. This is a survival MMO. It's a little bit of a different thing. I don't know if we're going to have the custom chat channels in the same way. Um, All right. But what I was going to say is they've definitely talked about it in the past, and their their logic is they want to start as minimal as possible with grouping systems and see how well it does. If the game does just fine without putting in a guild system of any sort, then they won't put one in. Uh, If it's something that becomes a necessity because it's just too hard to organize things one way or the other, or there's like design things that will have to depend on it, then I could see them doing, you know, really pushing forward with it. But for right now, it sounds like the goal is not until we actually know that we need it. So, I mean, it it seems like, you know, on, on one hand, they're kind of making sure that they don't commit resources to something that doesn't necessarily need the resources committed to immediately. On the other hand, though, it it's also, um, you know, something a lot of people have asked about and have a lot of concerns about because that's that's just what they're used to and that you know might turn them off to not have that as a feature i think we need some way to organize people i mean whether that's small scale just groups or whether we end up with something clans or outfits or whatever um i feel like it's a necessary feature but i don't know i guess to, to help agrees. to help with the um to help with the sort of story or sort of ab- Atmosphere. I can't think of the right word, but that you know, groups. which survivors tend to group. So I mean yeah. that, that. I agree with you, and it needs to be there at some point. Certainly, a sort of group guild way to, to again, because I. That's what I imagine survivors would do. You wouldn't just you would get some lone wolf lone wolfing it obviously, but you would. People tend to group together. You know, safety in numbers and all that jazz. What if it was instead something that we just do as a friends list feature? I don't know how all the friends list stuff is going to work out, and it'll probably change over the course of the project. Um, but yeah, you know what? I'm I'm wondering if it would be uh, if you instead of so basically the idea is that instead of organizing by like this person's a member of this group and this person's a member of this group. It's that you have to organize with your friends and create your own, you know, group list for who's in what group and kind of actively manage and maintain it um, by yourself. So you have to check in every now and then. It's like, hey, who, um, you know, did anybody leave the group recently? Is there Are there any new ads to the group that I need to add to the list? And the reason why that would kind of be an interesting way to do it is that nobody has an informational advantage that's built into the interface. You would have to check in with people regularly to know who's in the group and who's not anymore. Does that sound like it would be a reasonable way to go even even earlier on, or does that just sound like uh, busy work for the player? I, I, I don't know what I am. So one of the things that maybe have to see, I, I mean, what do you guys think? <laughs> the the other thing is that means if you and your friends are in multiple groups, instead of only being restricted to being in one guild or clan or outfit or whatever, using that friends list, you can kind of manage and maintain who your groups actually are. So it's like this is my you know small core group the. Junction Street Tigers or whatever. That was Bruce Lee's gang, by the way, when he was a kid. Um, <laughs> no joke. Uh, so you could have the so your, funny. your your medium sized group. Interesting tidbit. Yep. The um, the was full of them. The Woodbury Crew or whatever, and then your your large like mass group is just called you know Army of Zed or Army of Smedley or something and so you manage your groups differently using your friends list to know you know this small list isn't going to change it's just me and my buddies from school we're the Junction Street Tigers that's that's how we roll you've got your bigger group you know every now and then maybe you check in or maybe there's a way to way to share a friends list with somebody to uh, manage it that way and for the larger ones like yeah Anybody who says they're in that group, they're probably in that group. It really doesn't matter. All we do is just go out and burn all the trees on the server. <laughs> mm, I don't have a problem with with no friends list, no guilds, no anything like that. It's that's not. We're in the zombie survival, people. We're gonna the zombie survival. That's what we are in. 
<laughs> we're in the zombie apocalypse, people. We're trying to survive. We're not, you know, social networking. We're, we don't have any of that kind of, of uh, uh, technology. So you yeah, to- I mean, we can write on a piece of paper and that tells you who your friends are or something. Maybe that's something that, that we can do. But uh, it, it can't be anything, or I don't think it, it should be anything like, well, this person shows up green and you can blah, blah, whatever. That's, that's not what it's like. Well, I, I don't think people are necessarily going to show up green. Like maybe, maybe when you actually get in proximity to see somebody's name tag, but you're not going to see names tags from across the map. It's not going to be like... Uh, Planet side two, where if you get your sights on somebody five hundred meters away, you can see their name. Yeah. It's not going to be like that at all. So, right. I think it's going. I'm hoping it's going to be a very short radius, like ten meters initially, and then maybe if you've played with the person for a while, it builds up to as much as fifty meters. And that's still, mm-hmm. you know, that's a long way. But um, when we th- think about the ranges of a lot of the earlier weapons. 50 meters for even a handgun is kind of pushing it for the bows right. um that the the starting bow is definitely pushing it that thing's just so dinky it's hilarious take uh, a heck of a shot yeah either you, way i i would imagine wind would pick it up before i get there with the uh the starter bow uh um, yeah. throwing the spear once again you're not going to really have that much range so that seems like it'd be you know maybe the maximum uh to me the ideal range for where you would want um uh, the kind of the starting weapons and likewise where the, the maximum range of name tag visibility would be. But likewise, I think it should be a maximum. I don't think you should be able to see somebody's name tag immediately just because you saw them unless you're actually close enough to be like, oh, hey, I know right. your face now. Right. So he's he's going the other way on it then, folks. <laughs> the The minimal, I don't want to know nothing until I know it sort of thing. Again, it makes yep. it more realistic. I demand electricity in my zombie apocalypse, however. <laughs> <laughs> and if there's no, if there's no mobile phone team. network, if there's, if there's no mobile phone network, it's not worth surviving. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know what your mission is. Infect yourself with H1C1 at that point. <laughs> that actually is I, I, true I can be, in real I can life. be a zombie on the phone. <laughs> it is true in real life that if there's no phones, you might as well just end the world right now. <laughs> Oh, you're funny. No, no my whole body days. died the other day. It was horrendous. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> nobody cares about the actual. That nobody cares about the actual like being able to call somebody on their phone. It's not about that oh, no, anymore. God, no. Phones aren't. It's yeah, no. It's With about the smartphone. Yeah, exactly. You got Twitter and your Skype and everything. That's and your email. Like I don't know if any of you are the same way, but I haven't checked email on my computer for years since I got a smartphone. I just only do it on my phone. I literally didn't check my my email for like two weeks when I lost my phone for two weeks. I think this guy. Yeah, be silent. Whatever. Pen and for a bannon. All right. So, anyways, <laughs> um, yeah. No, uh, limited technology is going to be really fun to deal with because we're not going to have, you know, that much means of communication. It's going to be a big deal to take over one of the radio towers and actually, Mm -hmm. you know, get the network going, getting the getting the broadcast going, getting the power running to do it, getting the machinery running and and working again. You might have to take a um, was a like a fuse or something that would normally go in a car. And instead, you have to use it for the radio station or steal the battery out of a car, and that's what you're using to power it for, like, a five-minute broadcast. Um, the logistics of a radio would make things very, very difficult as well because um, people would actually have to have radios and have them on and have them tuned to that channel in order to actually catch that broadcast. So initially, it's the sort of thing that it would almost be a novelty to own one, unless you and your crew have radios, have batteries, and have communicated what the, sh- the channel they need to be on. But when you've got that going, it's almost like, well, do we want to do the in-game radio broadcast or do we just want to use TeamSpeak? And, you know, it's... Yeah, I mean, at that point, you're using voice comms outside the game, I'm sure. Mostly. Yeah. Uh, Burnt Toast J, I 
I'm pretty sure the devs are all hands on deck with the project right now. So unfortunately, none of them are available to join us with chat. Usually they do. Um, but, you know, as things are busy right now, um, if they take you know 30 minutes to watch the show, they'll have to come back on for 30 minutes later on to... Uh, finish up their shift at 3 a.m. or whatever. I, you know, I, I don't know. Things are in, like, super crunch mm -hmm. mode right now. It's a uh, project's yep. about to launch into early access. I've done this. I've been in we'll studios for it before. I, you know, I've seen it in previous projects at SOE. It's a big fucking deal. It is not something that is, you know, taken lightly. The entire company, not just the team, the entire company, like, the entire PR team normally deal with other games. Nothing right now. It's just H1Z1. So, um, it's a pretty big deal, this, this launch. So no, we don't have any, uh, devs available, unfortunately this time, but definitely tune in in the future. Jimmy Wisenhunt kept on saying, you know, I'd love to be on the show, but until we can really talk about weapons and using them, there wouldn't really be a point. So now we'll be able to potentially have Jimmy on the show in the future, but that'll be for Yay. next time or maybe in a, a hey. one in the future. I, I, not making any promises here but we'll have more devs on in the future just it's crunch time right now over there we can't expect them to be like breaking away from me. they might not even get bathroom breaks right now they might just have somebody going they were around. definitely working on <laughs> sunday or saturday weren't they 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 were talking about dev lunch on sunday or saturday i was like oh you guys that sucks i mean it'll be out soon and they'll maybe get to take a breather but yeah 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 i, I know that they were working through the weekend i had uh, dave one z one in my channel for a little bit and he was like yeah i just got home from work and I'm working all day tomorrow. I'm like, yeah. sorry. It's like, it was like probably midnight or one when we came in. So. Yeah, comes with the territory. But, oh, yeah. you know, it'll be, it'll be out pretty soon. And then they'll still be in crunch mode trying to fix anything that comes up real quickly. So it'll be... Yeah, uh, to fix the Yeah. Bring them some... Mob Lord... Yeah, that's awfully. That'd be awfully nice. But you know, like, also you could. You know, they put, have they have better coffee than I could bring them. Yeah, uh, I was gonna say like <laughs> they they would probably appreciate like some booze of some sort more because I'm sure they're running through yes. that pretty yeah. quickly. Uh, donuts. Right. <laughs> yeah, donuts. There you go. <laughs> One uh, person on the team is only for making sure everyone is hydrated and and full. I would sure. be that person. That would be a, the best. I job. would totally be Just paid for that. Do you that need anything? Nice. Do you need a back rub? Do you need water? I'm pretty sure that's what producers do. So. <laughs> we need to ask him. So we know what what uh, Steve is doing. <laughs> Well, I mean, the point of the producer's job is to you know find any requirements that anybody in the, ha uh, the team has, and you know find some way to take care of it. If that's getting an art asset to the programmers or you know, getting a coffee and a back rub to, you know, one of the artists or whatever. Hey, you know, job's job. Um, <laughs> Jane. I, w I would be the, yeah, I would be the guy just like Jane. I'd be like, yeah, I could take a back rub. I would just, just be like, you could just stay here for the rest of my shift. And back up the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, man. So um, what what weapons are you really excited give me your top three weapons everybody that you're really excited to get into bow and arrow bow and arrow bow and arrow both so the good bow and arrow the bad bow and arrow and the ugly bow and arrow a secret bow and arrow <laughs> <laughs> a secret awesome bow and arrow yeah i don't know about that i don't remember if they've got did they get the crossbow in i don't, I don't remember they've uh, said anything about it okay I know uh, it would be ridiculous not to have a crossbow. I mean, you know, it's basically take the arrows from a bow and the, the grip of a gun and ha-ha, crossbow. You know, seems easy enough, but, you know, it's way more to it than that. Um, Skyla, how about you for your, your three weapons? Um, I want to do some sort of uh, sniper rifle. A... Bow and arrow would be great, and a a ridiculous melee weapon. It's probably going to be morning wood, but I just really want to hit people in the face <laughs> with nails. Um, I'm less excited about the the spear. I don't really like it. Really, know. what what yeah. what about the spear in particular? I, I don't I don't know. I don't like the way it 
looks like it works. And then if you throw it, having to run and go get it just seems terrible. <laughs> well, it's it's never that, throw it. It's that or carry yeah. more than one spear. So if you throw it, you can yeah. still um. If it stacks up to more than one, yeah. Well, even if it doesn't stack, you can carry more than one. Like you can use your your one, two, three slots or whatever in your um on your quick bar to just you yeah. know you throw Speak the first two. <laughs> yeah. Now, I guess uh, another thing I'd like to see is a um, one of those kind of spear throwing things. It's basically a stick with a little notch at the end that basically doubles your mechanical advantage. So instead of you know holding the spear here, you'd be holding the end of this long um, stick that goes way back here, and that's where the uh, uh, the spear would be notched at. So when you move it forward it launches a lot more precisely it launches faster you can honestly make a a, a little air dart out of a twig in your backyard and use one of those little spear throwers to make it stick into a tree so i would imagine they would be pretty effective to uh, have as a survivor and actually while it'll probably have even more setup time and be you know really awkward and unyieldy to kind of aim to some extent that would potentially be the makeshift anti-vehicle weapon, something that actually produces enough force and actually has enough mass to be worthwhile against a vehicle. But yeah, right now I can agree. There's there's some properties of the spear that do seem a little little weird. Yeah, they're just kind of kind of clunky. Oh, a slingshot <laughs> with a scope. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, slingshot with mm -hmm. a scope. Act well. Not not like a, a Bart Simpson sling, slingshot, but like a full-on wrist rocket. The thing that, you know, you're holding it here. It's this giant, like, you know, surgical cable or whatever. You know, it gets a lot of tension. And whatever, you know, in the cup and you got whatever rock in there, you let it go. Yeah, you can hunt birds with that thing. You can you can hunt small animals. And you can probably knock someone silly if you hit them in the head right. <laughs> Jane, that sounds like fun, Dead Feature Ranchers Guild. <laughs> oh man. Uh File Fan, I don't did we ask you yet your uh your three? My three weapons. Um I would be looking for a a gun of some sort, a powerful gun of some sort. Not necessarily a sniper shot, but I don't know, maybe like a, a rifle or a powerful handgun. Um for some reason I I I, I believe it or not, I actually would be looking it would be keen to have like a, a flaming torch to set the, you know, the buggers on fire. Yeah. I just want to see the zombies <laughs> running amok burning. That appeals oh. to me in a sort of old school horror type sense. Um, third weapon. Probably a machete or something maybe. A machete style weapon. Yeah. That's, that's definitely... I think I have a lot of fun with that. Yeah. Machetes are pretty pretty big time. If, if you've ever... Yeah. Anybody who's ever actually used and swung a machete and had to chop stuff up with it they're um they're pretty well balanced it, it's basically like the smaller version of a chinese broadsword very um heavy chopping blade you're not really thrusting with it um uh, but it's basically weighted to chop things and chop with a lot of force and um really maximize the kind of point of impact towards the end of it rather than you know or Towards the maybe towards the middle of the end, towards rather than the very tip or somewhere in the center, or actually having to slash something rather than full on chop it. Yeah, you're, you're almost using it more like a hatchet than a uh, than a saber. So that's one that I'm excited for too. Um, I'm actually like spear, uh, machete, and crowbar are probably the three biggest ones for me initially. Just because really, all melee weapons, huh? Yeah, I, I just want to know like what the combo system's looking like, what the feel of it is, the timing, the balance, the differences in the variations I on the weapons. I think it's disabled right now. Ooh. It was disabled during the stream. Uh, it wasn't clear if it was going to be back up for hmm. the start of early access. You know, actually, it is in because I was watching Jimmy do the jab cross hook. Uh, it's a backup. Yeah. Now he was totally doing okay. that last night, so that was probably one of the things okay. they've been working on. That's that's kind of a deal breaker to not have that on day one. I'm pretty sure they've been focusing on getting that one in. Right. Combos so when are... they said they disabled it when they did the stream the other day, I was like, what? <laughs> For how long did you disable that? Because that seems a bit strange. But yeah, if it's back, then whatever. 
I'm guessing it was probably still still some issues with some of the new animations. I know they had worked in some new third person animations, and I think they were maybe working some new first person animations in too. Maybe not everything's linked up yet. So to save the embarrassment, they just disabled it temporarily for the the stuff on uh, uh, Friday. So that would make sense to me for sure. And seeing that it was actually active last night, um, it was probably just a quick fix that they needed. It just wasn't ready for the uh, the event on Friday. Yeah, a wood axe. That's that's correct, Falcon Gray. That is definitely one of the weapons out there. There's the there's a wood axe, and I believe there's also a fireman's axe. So there's, if I'm not mistaken, two versions. Though I don't know if both of them are in. And of course, then there's the 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 heavy metal axe, the uh, the guitar, which you know, you can smack things with. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it. I hope that makes like some sort of a, a weird musical sound, like you know, it's it's like guitar thunk noise yeah well it's, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't sound like an acoustic guitar it wouldn't be fully amplified it would have that like kind of weird muted you know when you're when you don't have an electric guitar plugged in but mm -hmm. a really really horrible like discordant sound coming off of it <laughs> so when you get hit for it it's like oh i just got hit with the guitar damn <laughs> yeah Oh, but yeah, the uh, the melee stuff. And the other thing is I really want to see what kind of utility we're going to have with the different melee weapons. I think uh, crowbars are going to have an extra functionality to pry things open that some of the other things won't have or some things will take more damage trying to do. Um, so that's, you know, I found a lot of those in my very first time playing it at the 12-hour um, the stream. Uh, Diggs was actually sitting there next to me watching the uh, watching the action and saw that yeah i found like three crowbars in one player in like one hour of play <laughs> that was still when it was set 15 years after the apocalypse so everything was all rusty and hilarious um but yeah fun stuff fun stuff good looking forward to those weapons and i guess maybe maybe now that i think about it maybe the guitar is actually on the list and i have to bump off uh machetes off the list there because i am really excited to hit someone with a guitar it's it's one of those things like on the whitelist server, you know that the person streaming is like, you know, all of a sudden, bong, yeah, that's. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Ah, uh, fun stuff. So will launch be messy? 150 to 200 servers. Um, will that be enough? I don't know. They can spin up more servers. Know. They can? I think that day one is going to be rocky. I think that anyone who's planning to stream day one is going to be in for maybe some not streaming. That's <laughs> actually, uh, I, I expect the opposite. I would imagine the major streamers and anybody you know lesser that, that's gotten a chance to contact them will potentially have access to the whitelisted server. I don't... I Maybe? Um, but I think... I think uh, you sh also being prepared for server outages would be a big thing. That's true. Well, yeah, if you're not going to be a part I, of I the feel like it'll be messy. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It could be. Landmark launched pretty well, and that's if you consider all of the servers and all of the islands, which is essentially just more servers, they started with right. a hell of a lot themselves, too, and things ran pretty stable. So, you know... Third, third times a charm, or third times a third times a curse with the uh, Forge Light engine. We'll see. I'm hoping that it's going to be the smoothest ever. And the other thing that they did with Landmark that they didn't do this time is launch it on you know a day that's not Super Bowl Sunday. Now that was kind of a big problem with Landmark. They launched it on Super Bowl Sunday, and then they realized, crap, we need more servers. I was in Dave's office on Saturday when he was like, well, yeah, things are running great. But unfortunately, we need more servers, and nobody's getting back to us, and they probably aren't until sometime midweek. So then, you know, midway in the week, they got more servers out. So I think it's a little bit of a different sort of thing. I'm sure Smed or somebody is, like, in contact with all the server people, and it's like, all right, if I tell you to, you open this shit up to 500 fucking servers. And 
you know, if there's just everybody banging at the doors like a, a horde of zombies, it's like, ah, we need more servers. That person will make the call, and bam, three more, three hundred more servers pop up. Maybe it wouldn't be three hundred. What's hard about What's hard about starting with a lot of, of servers a lot of the, that uh, a lot of people's perception is if you're uh, if you're taking servers away, then you're failing, and so they don't want to start too high because if they're like, oh yeah, so we're going from 500 to 300, which is still a crazy amount of people, but it, it's going to be it, you know people are gonna be like, oh well, this game must suck because you know they've already you know destroyed half their servers. And that's going to be a weird thing throughout early access is the idea that they might make updates that will require all of the worlds to be completely wiped, all of the progress, all of the uh, structures and everything. Yep. And when those sorts of wipes come along, that's the time that I could maybe see them consolidating the servers down to a smaller number. Anything short of that, and you're destroying people's progress, and that sucks. You're right. Exactly. I can't remember what what time is it over there, File Fan? It's it's like crazy early, isn't it? Um, where I am, it is coming up twenty to one in the morning. Gotcha. <laughs> well, Good we morning. we definitely appreciate you, uh, you know, coming through for this. I'm up at this time anyway, the best of times. So. All right then. <laughs> I, I'm more I'm more of a night owl anyway, so. <laughs> Yeah, very cool, very cool. Yeah, you and uh, Tobran, who he's taking a little bit of a break for a moment. Um, the both yes, of you, yes. just crazy, crazy hours. It's it's pretty interesting. <laughs> but, you know, it works out. Actually, I've seen, um, I know Eloheim uh, mostly streams towards the uh, the later parts of the day because most of his audience comes on late. So uh, yeah. we usually don't see him, but you probably see a lot more of him. Yeah, it's... It, it, it's it's kind of awkward to try to majority of my viewers for streamers are in America um, but I don't want to exclude like the European viewers as well so I try and balance it but I, I do <laughs> cater more to the America as to be said because most of my viewers are from America gotcha 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 yeah it's at 11 a.m. over there but the funny thing is that's that's 11 a.m. tomorrow and you're um, you're 1 a.m. tomorrow or almost 1 a.m. tomorrow so we're still living in the yeah. past over here I, <laughs> you are. I, I, I've now only got a day to wait for each one's dead one. That's true. That is true. See? Look <laughs> at the positives. <laughs> yep, yep. Living in the future. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> ben the Everyone Wonder say Boy. hi to Ben the Wonder Boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's funny. <laughs> Never heard of her. Good one, good one. Uh, man, so survival i guess uh now that we've kind of jumped around a little bit going back to the subject of survival were there any other things in particular that you wanted to um uh bring up or that anybody wanted to bring up on the subject okay. no all oh, right well i'm actually going to kind of talk about a little bit of the uh, the idea of um kind of the goal of why something would be taken over not just for the loot considerations but the other aspect of it, what I consider really end game in uh, H1Z1, is having permanent sustainable infrastructure that you've set up an area and you've got things in such a way that you don't even need to go out and find loot anymore. You don't need to go out and find supplies. The only reason you do is because maybe somebody's you know assault rifle wore down or whatever. And you have to go out and get a new one. Um, other than that, the idea of actual, or even being able to maintain it with machinery there, the the idea that you can take over an area, use it for you know farming, for food production, for fuel for production, use uh, potentially machinery that's there that you know would be hard to transport or manufacture or is otherwise impossible, that allows you to craft things that otherwise wouldn't be made, like actually being able to fabricate parts for uh, for weapons that you would normally otherwise have to find a complete version of that weapon out in the world to be able to use it. Um, then, you know, beyond just being able to make the fuel, actually being able to maintain your vehicles, having a fleet of vehicles that you use for various different operations in the area, and being able to not just, you know, keep them running, but also swap out parts, get them better parts. If you find some better batteries somewhere, throw those in. 
Uh, if you find some spark plugs that are in better condition, swap them out for those. Have some of the old parts as backups if you need them. And eventually, if you've got enough spare parts, you just need to find basically a gutted vehicle. and You can bring it back as your own, um, fix it up, and, and do what you need to with it. So that's, for me, stuff that I'm really, really excited to see is the ability to not just you know, take over an area and then kind of have to make operations in, in nearby areas, but actually to really be able to set up in such a way that you can't, um, it's really hard to be kind of dislodged from an area because it's so well set up, so well defended and so, you know, so well sustainable that you don't have to leave except on your own terms. And likewise, you have the ability to kind of force people in the area out of the area or mm -hmm. make them kind of, you know, conform to your terms or get shot. So with all of that said, um, does that even sound remotely like what the possibility of Endgame would look like in H1Z1? Or is that just, you know, kind of one stage along the the cycle of setting up and migrating and setting up and migrating that, that might potentially happen? I don't know if we're going to see large enough groups staying that organized for that long. Um, the amount of time that it takes to build a base that large. I think that it would be cool, and I think that the metagame or the end game or whatever does hopefully end up being about building and mm -hmm. about being uh, more self-sufficient and about uh, not just KOS, but I don't know. I think it's going to take us a long time to get there. Even on a PvE server. Pop. I think, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe not as long. I wonder if they'll actually, yeah. I forgot about PvE already. <laughs> well, the difference is that while PvE, you won't have threats from other players, the downside of that is people are going to be more ready to work together and congregate in an area, which means yeah. probably much higher more heat zombies. considerations. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. More bear stampedes. So will they have the ability to actually defend their their territory at that point? That's a good question. It it definitely would have to be a balancing act of like, you know, making sure that people are doing enough stuff supplied properly for what they need to be doing, that the area is set up for, you know, everything and there's contingencies in case something breaks through the main wall, you've got a secondary defense system. Um, I doubt they're going to give us the ability to make hedge mazes, but I think those would be wonderful. Um, what was it? Zombies Ate My Neighbors for SNES had one of those. Um, was that the name? I think that was the game. Uh, but what I was thinking about is not just the ability of building up uh, your own base to be able to do that, but that actually almost sounds like more the thing you would do when you take over a city that already exists having like a machine shop there transporting that machinery around doing something other than just getting juice to those and you know maintaining them and getting them up and running to do stuff with them that that seems a lot more reasonable than actually trying to build those things out in the world or actually try to transport them to your own uh location and it seems like there might actually be some very specialized things like possibly the ability to build and take over a um like a factory and manufacture things that that factory was producing before just given that you can provide more raw material like it's an anvil factory for whatever reason and you just need more you know uh, like a hundred metal scraps and get the machinery going you can make another anvil or two um, why an anvil factory Warner Brothers cartoons but um, you know that's that's that was my first that's thought that's as good a reason as any <laughs> absolutely i actually i hope that they would be tuned that you can have them at different pitches so as they're falling in unison be, or in in rhythm behind somebody it actually plays out a tune you know like in the cartoons but anyway <laughs> um back to the point the idea of actually having specialized stuff out there maybe not in the the starting areas but as you kind of venture out a little bit further where you can manufacture very specific specialized things and then what you're doing why you would take that area over is to have the advantage that yeah we're the only um twinkie factory in existence so bring your wheat and your sugar and your cream here and uh uh we can make twinkies out of it but we're probably going to shoot you and just make the twinkies for ourselves 
Uh, lumber mill, absolutely. That would make perfect sense. Um, when we get a little bit more systems in for water, right now we just have surface swimming. But once boats and diving and that sort of stuff, I'm sure we'll see a lot more like ports and docks and, and seaside sort of stuff like that. Um, I don't know that we can, like, burnt toast, yeah, if there's uh, factories and stuff that are out in the world, just like the radio stations being able to take those over and power them to use them again. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that they said is as you go out further, more specialized stuff that you'll be able to find. And one of the things that's potentially in the list there is having specific factories, specific facilities that manufacture certain things. The other thing for having one of those, even if you can't get it powered, is that it gives an excuse for that item to be spawning in higher concentration there than anywhere else. The secondary of that is that it then means that area is highly lootable for something that you can then use as a resource elsewhere in the world and use as a highly sought after trading item. That could be anything, you know, maybe it's um, expended cables or uh, full cables, cables of uh, uh, copper, you know, it's a big old spool. You're not going to be able to pick it up yourself. The thing weighs a few tons, but um, being able to roll one around somewhere um, and you, being able to use them to set up as anything from tables to barricades to obstacle courses to, to make it harder for zombies to get around. Um, I could see those actually being a useful and tactically relevant sort of thing. Yeah, you'll sell your beer to anyone. What do you put in your beer, DK? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Let's see. We can grow corn and wheat. Let's make it happen. We can grow corn. We can grow wheat. Um, we've got cans of beets. I would imagine you could probably make those ferment some way or another. Um, soda. I can. I'm sure I could ferment that too. <laughs> Maybe not the best. This is not gonna end well. <laughs> not the best idea. <laughs> yeah. Wheat beer. Well, yeah, wheat beer would definitely be a, a good way to go. The other thing we would need is some sort of um, you know, hops or something to kind of represent it. Um, Troll phaser. No, what you're looking for is swizzle. There is no, there's no mushrooms. There's no cannabis. There's no opium. There's no methamphetamines. What there is is swizzle. There is swizzle in H1Z1. They were all burned in the apocalypse. <laughs> Yes, they they Just were all burned in the apocalypse. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> no. It's they they in order to kind of not only make things a little bit more approachable and not have the you know warning drug use label on the game, which it might still have. Um, swizzle is what they call it, and it's from what I remember, it looked like a little baggie of something. Though when uh, uh, Sony Shock was put on the spot about it during the the stream with Paul Carrico, he said, "No, it's an energy drink. That's why it makes you. Know, it's because you're all like sped up and everything." It's a Red Bull that gives you wings. Yeah, like yeah, no, that shit fucks you up. That is that is some psychotropic <laughs> shit right there. So <laughs> yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out in the game. Uh, what kind of weird, hilarious things people do with it. If it's going to be the thing, you know, uh, co-carnage and his crew find somebody that's not part of the group and's like, hey, all right, now give us what's in your backpack. Now smoke this. Or I guess consume, I think, is what it's going to be. I don't think there's going to be a smoke command in the game. Unless maybe meat. I'd love to smoke some pork in that game, but then, later on, later on. Um, you know, and then, then make the person run around to try to hunt something with a bow and arrow while they're tripping out on Swizzle. It'd be hilarious. I'm sure it's going to happen a lot. <laughs> Mob Lord, uh, somebody had asked about it. Uh, Twinkies, yes. Lace Twinkies with Swizzle. That sounds like a great idea, Falcon Gray. <laughs> Alright, by the way, everybody... We're kind of open for uh, Q and A, so if you uh, if you have some questions you want to ask, definitely shoot. Um, I can see that there's we've we've kind of gone into ramble tor territory a few times here, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so um, I guess kind of more stuff to talk about. Was there was there anything else in particular like getting into the uh, the early access? Any hopes, any considerations, any things you're worried about, public service announcements, um, anything like that, or pretty much just 
hype train, hyped up for it. Can't wait to see it. I'm really excited. I, I mean, I am hyped or whatever, but I, I, f I feel like my expectations are realistic. Like, I know that this is a vertical slice of gameplay. I know that what we're going to be seeing on day one isn't what we're going to be seeing for the rest of the game. I know that there's a lot to go, and I don't know. I, th I think that maybe some other people who are following the game aren't. Like, they think, they're like, where's the, you know, X whatever feature? It's like, yeah, I mean, maybe, but it's going to take a while to get there. Um, I don't know if people have their expectations set accordingly, even though SOE has tried to set them multiple times. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm afraid of how Reddit's going to look <laughs> after day one. <laughs> Oh, well, it's going to be kind of a funny place for a little while. I'm probably not going to check in on day one except for some laughs. Um, we had a question there, and it was actually answered about vehicles in the game. Yes, there's going to be the off-roader that we've already seen. There's going to be the police car, and there's going to be the truck. And there's going to be more vehicles down the road. The bicycle has been talked about a lot. I believe we've seen a model of the bicycle, but I don't think we've seen it in use quite yet. Um, Mob Lord, question. you believe two people per server at the size it is? Okay, contrast. Be a constant firefight and zero progress towards crafting. Um, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be a constant firefight. Planet side two, I can have two thousand people on a continent, and I can still find areas where there's nobody for like, you know, within five minutes travel in any direction. So I don't think there's going to be issues with player I'll density. Be right back, guys. Go for it. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's going to be the opposite. You find another player, it's like. Holy shit, it's not a bear, it's not a zombie, it's not a bear, it's not a zombie, it's not a wolf, it's not a zombie, it's not a bear, it's a player. Holy shit, a rare sighting. I'm gonna kill him. Oh, maybe not that, but <laughs> um, the idea that... That's what happens at Daisy. Yeah, it is. Actually, it was, um, I can't remember the name of it, one of our buddies was trying to do a demo of uh, one of the games and pretty much every one of his demos ended up him being basically gunned down on a bridge with an SMG. And it's like, well, you know, <laughs> that's it. You know, <laughs> that's all the game is. You know, it's basically a giant arena shooter at that point. I'm pretty sure that's definitely not the goal for H1Z1. It's just to be a giant arena shooter. That's what Planet I do is for. This is completely different. Um, female zombies and characters. That's a great question. Um... Female zombies are not going to be going in at the start of early access, but as it's been talked about a bunch, female and multiple body types are going to be coming in somewhere down the road. I, uh, yeah, during early access, before launch, there will be female character models. Um, hopefully soon. Yeah. And I'm sure they've made a lot of progress on them, but... Yeah, I think a lot of the same folks that have been working on the modeling and stuff for that are probably also working on the current stuff that needs to be worked out yeah. and you know, finalized. We saw the uh that link for the jump animation uh earlier and then Jimmy's, you know, the look on his face. It does look a little bit better than some of the previous jumps I think I've seen, but still has a little bit of ways to go. So, you know, it's it's a process. They've got to get everything working right. They're just we're just now getting a vertical slice of one of everything working right. You know, give them a little bit of time before they give us some some of the variation on that. Hey guys. Uh Poro, it it is and it isn't. It's one of those things where just to get the vertical slice out there, they specifically decide, let's just go with one playable character. And we'll do all the variation later, but let's just get one of them that works and is linked up in all the ways that we need it to. And the reason why they yeah. went with a male, a white male, is because that was Bill Yates' head scan that they had available. So, you know, base the rest of the character on the on the head scans. Like, oh yeah, it's Bill Yates' head on a sexy female body of uh, you know, <laughs> international hey, you origin. Yeah, I, don't <laughs> I sent them my head scan, but they chose his instead. You don't have a head scan, you dark. I could. No, you don't. <laughs> you would have brought this up on like 20 previous episodes. <laughs> hey. I'm calling you out, boy. Yeah. You have to spread out information. You can't give everything in one episode or you have nothing to talk about. <laughs> uh. <sighs> stuff. PvP... What I like about the PvC per is that you have PvP and PvE. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I think one of the fun things on the PvE server is how you actually have to deal with people that are a threat in the community, people that are causing trouble. You can't just stick them with spears. That's not going to work. So what I wonder is, what will work? What are you going to be able to do? Do you have to create a push them against a tree, light the tree on fire, and keep them there until it burns them? Uh, is it, do you do you, do player made traps work if you put it down a bunch of the uh, you know this the sharpened sticks smeared with poo and just push them into that? Will that work? Um, so that's that's something I'm really wondering about. Is in a PVE environment, what things we'll be able to do that are still you know, not necessarily PvP so much as you need to kill a player because they're a problem. You need to have some tool to do it. What's what's going to be the way is, um, I, I don't know. Yes, DK, that's how you make them more infectious and deadly. Don't step on them. <laughs> <laughs> what makes you think this game will have a future and not uh, take a death turn like Rust? Well... SOE has a kind of a habit of finishing their games when they start them, their own in-house stuff. What? Yeah. So uh, I don't think it's going to stall out, um, especially considering they already did pull a lot of the assets from the PlanetSide 2 team and dedicated it to H1Z1 to make sure it would be able to uh, do all the stuff that it needs to in a timely manner. So, you know, they're they're going to make this happen. Plus... This is also a tech test for the eventual Storm Undrung, the eight, uh, um, World War II open world um, sandbox military survival war thing. We don't know much about it, but it was mentioned at SOE Live last year in very small detail, and I've kind of picked a little bit at it here and there with the different folks to get a little bit more information. We got a lot of detail, actually, when Sony Shock was on uh, a couple of episodes ago, so if you want more information, do tune in, and I apologize for the Wilhelms. Because uh, it was going nuts. Um, oh, yeah. We've got ourselves a winner. Let's see who the Yay. winner is. Now, keep in mind, folks, you've got to be following the channel, and you've got to be present to actually win the raffle here. So I'm going to give a few minutes for everybody to follow the channel if you haven't yet. And then we'll draw. Please let it be Kremchek. <laughs> Kremchek unfollowed. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You didn't unfollow. <laughs> um, yeah. So we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a moment. Hmm. Some more questions. Yeah, they've s launched five successful MMOs, three in the works. Yeah, exactly, Zach. They they kind of know what they're doing. Uh, they even completed Vanguard. Yeah, successful. Well, successful. Pretty much big shots. <laughs> <laughs> they well, have. They've also maybe messed up an MMO or two at some point. <laughs> yeah. Well, they have. Um, <laughs> Not in the last year, though. <laughs> Uh, Poro, I think you're thinking of Wizardry. Vanguard was made by, if I'm not mistaken, that was Brad McQuaid's project after he left EverQuest. Yep. So, yeah, it was it was made in the States here. Uh, yeah, Star Wars Galaxy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hate on that. But that was, once again, they were kind of on the handcuffs a little bit because they also had to, you know, be second-guessed by LucasArts the entire time. So, you know, I don't know the internal debates and stuff with that too but i'm sure it was quite quite epic and quite um production ruining <laughs> quite <So. epic. laughs> they were first guessed by lucas arts probably <laughs> yeah that too um <laughs> so yeah this isn't going to stall out and the other thing is beyond all the other reasons smelly loves this in fact the entire team when when they're thinking about well what do mm. we what are we going to do for the moment? And someone brought up zombie survival and it was pretty much unanimous. Like, yeah, we totally need to do that. That's totally awesome. You know, a lot of the team play watches, uh, well, plays too, uh, Daisy and uh, Rust and some of the other ones out there. Yep. So this is coming from a, a position of love for them. It isn't just, um, this is the project I'm working on because this is what I work on now. Um, but it's, you know, this is something they really, really, really want to see happen. I want it to be 
the best project possible. And when you have people doing that, they're willing to put in the extra hours. They're willing to put in the time and the effort. They're willing to, you know, campaign for something and be an advocate for a system they feel is the uh, the right way for the game to go and will pursue it rather than, you know, after a week being like, ah, screw it. I might maybe get a ground on this. Um, yes, Burnt Toast, that is such an aside, but yes, Choice Chamber, I am excited for Beta 4. I will <laughs> mention Choice Chamber for a specific moment here because it's the best game right now in terms of Twitch integration, and I think it serves as a model for a lot of games, H1Z1 included, for ways to include Twitch viewers in an actual game broadcast in when you're actually playing the game to have something where your viewers are involved. Uh, yeah, for sure. So it it would translate to probably something completely different in H1Z1, and I don't think it'd be something where the players are necessarily getting an advantage or any hindrance from from the the chat. But there could be potentially other things that go along with it. It could be you know maybe the chat's choosing what the color of the next shirt you find is. So when you finally find a shirt in the world, it's like oh, it's navy blue. Thanks guys. You know, <laughs> whatever you know. <laughs> Everybody hates navy blue. Navy blue hype! <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Or plaid. I would go I would go nuts for plaid. <laughs> yes, give me plaid. I want to be like Grunge Rocker up in here. <laughs> I want to be like Paul Bunyan. Yeah, there you go. Eh, more or less the same. Didn't Paul Bunyan come from Seattle? Anyway. Sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's Grunge Rock. <laughs> Wait, isn't Paul Bunyan a fictional like, fairy tale creature? Fictional people come yeah. from real places. Happens all the time. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, fictional people come from fictional places too. Real people come from fictional places. I mean, I came from Atlantis. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, it's on my birth certificate. Just <laughs> approximately Atlantis is what it says was where I'm from. <laughs> approximately. Ah. <laughs> uh, Oh, yeah, H1Z1 Battle Royale, Gamer Nub. That is going to be a lot of fun. I am really excited for that. Yeah, Battle Royale is going to be... Oh, good stuff, good stuff. So, if anybody's not familiar with Battle Royale or, I guess, what's that, the Thirst Games or something that the kids watch these days? Um, Food Games? Uh, what's the name? Someone help me out here. Yes, something like that. Something like that. It's like a more modern version of the same sort of thing. Basically, the, the, the idea is, from what I understand, there's you and a finite number of people start at the beginning of it, and as people die, it kind of ticks down how many people are still alive, so you kind of know how many more objectives there are left. There's, um, you know, all sorts of stuff out in the world that you can use, anything from... You know, stuff to help, you know, food and survival in that way, and weapons and vehicles and armor and potentially things you can use to set up traps and ambush points. And it's pretty much just a big open world, you know, death match. It's, it's, it's a one life death match. Now, what's really interesting about it and what I think is really, really cool is this has been talked about with the, um, kind of the hearthstone arena system in mind as an example not as like the paradigm for how to do it that as you fight on more and um do better in them you'll get a better reward out of the ticket-based servers that you enter and i'm guessing this is going to be one of the ticket-based servers um but likewise if you die right off the bat you're still going to get something for it what that is i don't know but uh, maybe it's a tenth of a ticket or something. It could even it could actually be a distribution kind of like uh, online poker tables or whatever that you um, you get next to nothing or maybe you get a tenth of a, a re-entry or whatever if you get wiped out real soon. And then as you get into like the final uh, final hundred people and then the final table or whatever, the rewards start to scale up you know really really big time. So if you're number one or even number three. You know what you're getting out of is way way bigger than the first person to die got, but everybody's gonna get a little bit of something. Yep, it's gonna be a cool cool uh, server set there. 
Life? What are you talking about? Life mods, Max and Max. I don't know what this life mods is. I don't know what he's talking about either. That's a good question. Have you seen the Battle Royale shirt that you can win? I didn't know there was a Battle Royale shirt that you can win, but that's awesome. Does it come in different colors for multiple winners? Yeah, life mods. We don't know. What are you talking about, Max and Max? <laughs> you tell me. You don't ask me. You tell me. <laughs> then we can kind of go from there. <laughs> you goofball. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Um, I don't know. Probably at some point. Um. I, I have no idea. Uh, I, I don't know that it's been talked about much, but I know it's something that the devs have watched. I think some of them have even played. I think I've caught maybe it was Jimmy or Clegg playing it once or twice. So it's um it's probably something that's on the radar. It's definitely something that they've got in consideration. But the actual you know terms of it and stuff, I have no idea. Yeah, RP to the Mac. Well... You kind of forced to RP in um, H1Z1 regardless. Whether you're, you know, full on talking in character and you know having a having that motivation and everything and you know doing that aspect of it, or you're just playing the game. Just playing the game, you're still playing a role in a uh, you know living you know evolving world. So even in that, if you don't say anything to anybody, you're still playing a role in the world. You're still essentially role playing. There's no way to avoid it. Some games you can kind of avoid it. Like I think of World of Warcraft, I could play through the entire game without talking to a single person except for you know forming a raid group. And once the raid group's formed, I don't have to say a damn thing to them other than "Oh man, you didn't heal me," or "Oh man, you're a shitty tank." But you know that's that's <laughs> a completely different sort of beast. Um, the the fact that you're there, there's really no way to avoid being in a role play situation because at some point. Someone's going to point a gun at you and you got to pick something, whether it's based on, you know, your character and their mentality is a, a virtuous hero or whether it's you, the player, thinking, shit, I better do something about this guy. You know, you have to do something. A, a chicken, a chicken in H1Z1. That, well, eventually they're going to have chickens in the game. Know, maybe eventually we'll be able to play as them. Um, oh, please <laughs> Chickens, chickens. So actually, that was something that I asked about um, yesterday, if the um, Clegg's chicken sandwiches would still be spawning around. I can't remember if we got a clear answer or not. So maybe a month or two ago, I was watching a broadcast, and in one of the abandoned gas stations, there was a chicken sandwich. And I'm thinking, dude, that thing's got to be like two months old or a year old or however long old. That place looked freaking dilapidated, and I've been there for a while like that. But you know what? Fresh chicken sandwich. He didn't question it. Went up and ate it. No problem. So I asked, you know, well, are, are we going to see that? Are we going to see like complete healthy fresh chicken sandwiches spawning on shelves or, you know, or, is, is that going to happen? So I don't know if it's going to happen or not. <laughs> I'll have to check back yesterday and see, see what he said. But I don't think there was uh, really a clear answer. Um, I think they just kind of joked about it and then moved on. <laughs> Probably. Yeah, preserve his, yeah, seriously. Uh, even there's a lot of preserve his video. It, it would take more than just preserve just to keep a chicken sandwich going for like six months. Got rabbits, the chicken of the fields and woods. Yes, yes, you are absolutely right, Jane. <laughs> Rabbit is the chicken of the field and woods. <laughs> That's awesome. Ah. Uh, no, Jane, there's not going to be dismemberment. You're not going to have bunny heads on sticks. That's going to stay in your fan art only. <laughs> <laughs> Which is hilarious. By the way, if anybody hasn't seen H1Z1 Jane's fan art, it's hilarious. For sure. Yeah, a Halloween-style mod, maybe, where they can have heads on sticks for the duration of October. It's, it's something that they would be putting in uh, a full game's worth of effort for limited regions and multiple yeah. builds because... I know in China, I think in Australia, and I'm pretty sure in some places in Europe, uh, depictions of dismemberment, severed heads, um, not allowed. They That gets a game banned. So uh, I'm pretty sure they're going to avoid that in all places possible. There's going to be gore in the game a little bit, you know, blood coming out of things and stuff, 
but uh, there's not going to be like organs spilling out. There's not going to be limbs getting chopped off. And that's, I would say specifically because it's extra work they would have to do that they would then have to pull from half the versions of the game they distribute, which it's, it's just not a good use. Yeah. Of that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. yeah. It'd be different if it was like, you know, some little quick 2d flash game or whatever, but you know, the scale of the project, it dictates that you, it really wouldn't make sense. It would be, I'm really excited to see what kind of props they are going to add for the different holidays because as we've seen with Landmark, all of those holiday props can be used for so many other things and it's actually really, really useful. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering what kind of stuff we're going to see in H1Z1 if they're going to wait till, you know, around October and then they're going to introduce pumpkins to the game. And then you'll be able to cook pumpkins, being able to use the seeds for stuff, uh, being able to, for hilarious effect, make a jack-o'-lantern or make a helmet out of it that's, you know, just literally just for fun. It's like, yes, you've got a pumpkin on your head. It's helping to insulate from some of the rain, but it smells terrible. Unless you like the smell of that sort of thing for some reason. I don't know. I don't. I never really liked the smell of an open pumpkin that much. Ah, oh. Twitch phone app. Oh yeah. Um, what attracts walkers? That's a good question. Um, a lot of everything. Make noise in an area. Make sound in an area. Make impact in an area. You know, chop down a tree. Shoot something. Uh, lots of people. Lots of people. Yep. Drive a vehicle through. Uh, <laughs> or you can more easily just say heat, sound, sight, yep. smell. Most people don't understand what I found, what heat means. Um, they think we mean actual heat. Well, Sometimes it requires some explanation. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's the, the thermal temperature definitely is something, but heat when they when they talk about heat it's specifically more of a map of kind of what's going on in the area where stuff has gone on like a heat map a distribution of what actions have gone on recently and that heat map is constantly changing for like where the hot spots of action are and where the slow spots mm -hmm. are and that's going to change based on what the players are doing what animals and wildlife is doing what the zombies are doing uh, a bear sends a bunch of deer scurrying those deer then run their way basically into and through a zombie horde. They're creating heat on their own. Like that's the most advantageous mm -hmm. situation for players is when wildlife and zombies are interacting so that you don't have to deal with either of them for a moment. Right. <laughs> um, yeah. So that is a good question, Maximilian. Everybody who was going to follow the channel should have followed the channel by now. So let's see. Who our winner is. Good luck, everyone. Good luck, everyone. Falcon Gray. Hey, Falcon. Falcon. And I see that you're here. Congratulations, Yay. Falcon. Congratulations. Awesome, awesome. Very cool. It'll be fun. He to stole play my copy. And and what? Oh, no, no. He was going to win a copy <laughs> on your channel anyway. No, no, no. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. <laughs> yeah. No, he was probably going to win a copy on one of our channels one way or another. <laughs> Yeah, he probably would. Yeah, so very cool. Awesome, awesome. <laughs> Burn toast. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we've got about uh, uh, 50 minutes left, so we're probably going to do QA for a little bit more and then start to wrap up here. Flex. Oh, Flex. You always come in at the end of the show as you're so awesome. Uh, <laughs> it started an hour and 45 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Flex is so awesome. They always come to the end of shows. <laughs> Flex makes it for the A1P1 right at the beginning. That's true. That is true. Beer can sounds like bacon with some accent. Yes. <laughs> that is true. All right. All right. You know, yes, repeat everything we said from the beginning. Yes. yes we'll start over. There, there's start again, guys. <laughs> something that we haven't actually talked about. We didn't say much. It's um, it's come up a couple of times. I haven't heard anything recently on it. 
Has there been any word on what's going on with restraints, handcuffs and, you know, zip ties and that sort of stuff? Is that in for early access? Is that pending for early access? Will be in for early access. It is not in at Just release for early yeah. access. Yeah. Which is hilarious. That was one of my favorite memories from Rust was my friends uh, handcuffing someone and throwing them into a cage and force feeding them raw chicken. And taking all their clothes off. <laughs> <laughs> um, Poro, um, they a, a wolf in the wild that's looking for prey. They're looking for whatever prey. If it's you, it's you. If it's something else, it's something else. Uh, Vamp evil, good ideas. Uh, Fubar, uh, karma system. <clears throat> Let me actually I need to scroll up and catch the one. <laughs> With you bad people should not grow horns. I'd like to hear some thoughts of how karma system would possibly <laughs> reduce KOS. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways that the karma system could work. I guess the uh, the big thing for me is that if there's going to be a karma system, it needs. It, it feels like it needs to be something that's not really intrusive. That unless you're actually looking for it, you can't really, you know, you're not going to be able to tell somebody, you know, a good person from a bad person from a mile away that you would actually have to go up and, you know, kind of engage them for a moment or, you know, I guess it would, when I think of karma, I also think of like a bounty system. So um, it could be something where maybe like a PVE server has a karma system that somebody only can be attacked by other players when they've caused enough harm that a bounty is out on them. Um, there's, there's just so many different angles and different ways to go. Um, yeah, well, Poro, I mean, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. They look like pretty big wolves, but yeah, Karma. Like any... I put in chat, we're not their first choice, but we'll, we're definitely a good backup plan. Yeah. Well, if need be. What what I guess around the table, um sorry with you, File Fan, what are your kind of thoughts on a karma system? Um, ways to without having like horns or making them glow red from a distance, some way to indicate it and make it useful to reduce KOS. Um again I'm torn between what would be more realistic and what would be better from a playing point of view. Mm. Um I don't know. I I'd lead more towards no karma system, really. Well, um, the, the, I guess the question is. I agree. Knowing that there is going yep. to be a karma system for some people, yeah, I it, it's kind of tough to ask us about it because none of us are really looking for it. So, it's it's you know I could extrapolate on it probably more after the show or you know some other time. But I think I already had a lot of my thoughts uh, on a previous episode or something that I wrote out somewhere. Yeah, we've talked about it a lot. I got a question. Are you able to sell your tickets to other players or do them for other things for uh, Battle Royale? There will be things other than Battle Royale to use them for. I have no idea if there's going to be trading between players. I'm guessing likely no on that one because it's probably going to be something they can sell with uh, or you can buy with Station Cash. So they wouldn't want something you buy with Station Cash and you know trade amongst your friends. Or maybe they would. Um I would almost be more concerned that they would want to limit that and limit any sort of thing where somebody would have an advantage for taking over somebody's Steam account, logging into it, using their, their Steam wallet features or whatever to buy a bunch of stuff, ring up a big old charge on the account. But then again, I don't know that we're going to be able to do that. I guess we're still going to be doing station cash. You're not going to be able to do uh, purchase that of Steam. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what's going to go on with the tickets. We'll know very soon. We actually, they, they <laughs> still have, you know, not revealed all the details on tickets yet. That's something I've been kind of waiting for this week. Yeah, me too. It's not very discreet. You go to the Steam page and it's like, oh, you get, you know, event tickets or you get whatever. And none of it's really laid out yet. So hopefully that happens before launch, maybe tomorrow. Uh, Sandros, I don't know if there's going to be a built-in Battle Royale. Zube, I have no idea about the headshot-only servers. Um, I would imagine yes. that it is one-shot kills. Yeah, it is. Okay, good to know, good to know. Um, yeah, let's see. Any last question? We've got a little bit more time here. Uh, Jim, what, what are you talking about, Krem? 
<laughs> A1P1 podcast says, I got to bail the gym calls, but I know him a little better than that. <laughs> Just teasing. Yeah. Skyla's right, Jim then bar. Jim then bar. Yeah, right. Jim. <laughs> Don't do bar than Jim. That's dangerous, and I do not recommend it. <laughs> well, I mean, unless you love to live dangerously, because the, the added advantage of alcohol is that it is basically like the most ready to use and kick ass carbohydrate that could possibly exist. It just has the unfortunate side effect that it gets us drunk. If it didn't get us drunk, it'd be the perfect energy drink. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't run on treadmills when after after going to the bar. Because you've done that before. Yeah, the coordination is No, the I've never there. done that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think I am? <laughs> There are many things Skylatron might do this. drunk, and she will not go on a treadmill drunk. <laughs> and I second that. So I would not go on a treadmill again. drunk either. That that does not sound like a good idea. <laughs> he has Enticus. You missed all of the shows, Enticus. <laughs> you, you missed all of the show. <laughs> We're oh, just BSing man. now. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. I don't know. I feel like we've been kind of BSing a little bit the entire show. It's It's been a little weird because it's like, it's so, you know, ready to come through and it's like right there, but it's like, well, it's going to be here at a moment. It's, it's kind of hard it, to it talk almost, about. Yeah, it almost felt this. hard to even <laughs> say words. <laughs> because it was so close, like, well, why don't we just do it? On, you know, find out in two days. Yeah, fortunately, I was distracted by the burlesque show going behind your green screen there, Krem. So I, uh, it didn't fully <laughs> impact me the entire time. What? The, the, the four-year-old burlesque show. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we, the the green screen there's got the light shining through from the yeah. other side. So whenever you see somebody walking by, it's just a silhouette. So I joked about it being like a. A burlesque show. Oh, nobody was actually like taking their clothes off. No, right? no, I no, don't no, think no. So. It's my daughter <laughs> playing on the bed. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's just, it's just a joke. It's funny. <laughs> it is funny. It is really. Funny. Either way, would he be funny. has been. <laughs> Neuro has been married to her on The Sims before, so <laughs> yeah, that totally happened. Your daughter? Never mind. Actually, I'm not gonna ask. I'm not gonna ask. <laughs> hey, it's The Sims. Like you, you, pro you probably don't want to know. <laughs> before we start wrapping up, last thought on that subject. Sog played his character in such a way that his character was young, and he had his old person children sitting on his lap. So, like. <laughs> That game's just weird to begin with. Yes, it is. <laughs> oh, that game is so... I, I'm going to say wrong, but it's so right at the same time for so, so many right. different reasons. It's it's just basically a different play, different way of playing with Barbie dolls, essentially. it's uh, You, you dress yeah. them up, you go out th you know, through their lives, you, they got their house, and you play with the furniture. And, yeah, you know, it's it, same thing, basically. Didn't Sag sleep with absolutely everybody at one point? <laughs> yes, yes, Hobo Joe slept around. <laughs> <laughs> That's really point. the only thing to do in Sims anymore. <laughs> Nobody actually tries to play The Sims anymore. When a new game comes out, we just see what weird shit we can do. I think Krem's wife still tries to play the game, but I think she was killing a bunch of people off at some point by accident. So I don't know if that's an accident. So is, an accident. Is a, yeah. Who knows if that was really an accident? Oh Seems no, like, your like, door's nine missing. Nine people died in two days. Oh no, your something. door's missing and the room's on fire. Oh no, you're in the right. pool and they took away the ladder to get out. That was that was old school Sims, the way you kill someone. You put them in a pool and then you take out the ladder and they just swim around until they be there short to die. Yeah, you lock them in my bath. <laughs> oh, way off subject. We're going to be playing zombie <laughs> sims here in a moment, trying to survive and uh, <laughs> yes. do, all, do all that fun stuff here one very, 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 very soon. So, on that note, let us wrap up the show here. Uh, going around the table here, File Fan, why don't you uh, let people know who you are, what you're about, where they can find you, and what kind of awesome stuff you're going to be up to. Uh, I'm File Fan. I'm from Scotland, UK. Um, I stream... Fairly I don't have a dedicated schedule yet, but I stream fairly regularly. You'll find me on twitch.tv forward slash filefan or Twitter at filefan underscore. Um, over to the next person. Skyla. Hi, I'm Skylatron. Pretty much everywhere on the internet, Twitch, Twitter, and other places. I'm the social media manager for 10 Ton Hammer and All Around Trainwreck. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody to look for for guides on H1Z1 coming up here. Yes. Yep. Uh, yeah, we'll be doing, and I will be doing a crap ton of guides for H1Z1, so 
that is going to be a lot of fun. And we'll also be streaming it on the uh, Tent on Hammer Twitch channel as well. That'll be a lot of fun. She's also good for where to go on Drunken Wednesday guides. <laughs> yes. I could see that too, yeah, for sure. <laughs> All right. Kremi, passing it to you. Yes, I am Kremchek, and I'm a full time streamer, and uh, I'll be doing a 96 hour stream on uh, H1Z1 on thir or starting on Thursday. And we're going to be doing a bunch of game giveaways. We will possibly be giving away a couple copies of H1Z1, but we'll definitely be doing, I think I'm planning on, I have like 30-something games to give away right now. I'm planning on having about 150 more. Uh, so uh, during the four days, we'll be doing roughly-ish 200 uh, game giveaways. So that's about, uh, that. that's a little bit more than two an hour. So that'll be really fun. And we'll be drunk a lot, too. Just saying. You're nuts, man. It's going to be fun. It's going to be You're so much fun. You're probably going to die. Oh. In game, oh, yeah, the, the character's probably going to die maybe, let's see, 96 hours, so 500 to 1,000 time? times? <laughs> it could be, <laughs> especially when Kari's playing. Yeah, I was going to say, Kari's going to bump the count up real quick. You know, by the end, she's going to yeah. learn the game pretty good, though. Yeah, yeah, I would <laughs> bet. Skylamit in real life, though, this is what she's hoping for. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> No, Zubay. I don't. I don't think they've got a uh, uh, a toilet set up over there for uh, playing Wildcraft. It's, it's going to be you know people in rotation. <laughs> anyway, no, this chair is actually never mind. <laughs> it's like that chair I've from been doing uh, that the whole time. You know, the from the beginning of Idiocracy, where uh, you know, dude's just sitting in the lazy boy that's got a toilet installed. <laughs> that's his. Uh, that's where he chills all day. <laughs> it's gross. Is it weird to say I'm I'm doing that right now? Uh, would that be weird? It would be, but we also wouldn't believe you because you didn't you didn't make it a poo poo face like uh, Cereal kept on saying there. And I'm just good at hiding. Ah, uh, and I am legendary neurotoxin. You can find he here. You can find me here. I'm, well, uh, a couple of drinks he, here. You can find me. <laughs> you can find me here at um, legendary neurotoxin on you know all times throughout the week. I do. Dead Feature Rant. Live Feature Rant for Landmark after the Landmark Live shows. Theory Forge on Fridays, and that rotates between a few different channels. And content and creations if you like Landmark stuff. And you know what? Chances are at some point I'll try to find some way to set up a tour show in H1Z1 just to try to check out some of the cool builds people have made. <laughs> but I think survival might be an issue with that one. So I don't know how well that's going to go. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. you have to take a drink every time you die you know, <laughs> during your survival or your. Uh... Never mind. Yeah. Words are hard. I'd probably switch to beer at that point. Um, but anyway, that wraps things up. So we are going to bring this party somewhere awesome after we bring up the title screen. But for now, we are wrapping up the show. Thank you all very much. And if you missed part of the show or if you want to get your friends a chance to watch the show and you know not miss out on this or any of the previous episodes except that one Twitch accidentally deleted, uh, you can find this on yes. the YouTube channel, youtube.com front slash legendary neurotoxin. And go through the entire playlist. You'll want to, for sure. Do it. All right. Yep. See you all later. Bye. Bye. Bye.